Hello, welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Um, earlier this week, in honor of Pride Month, I wrote out an essay and published it to my personal Facebook page. And I did not realize it at the time, but it is 10 pages in my Google Docs. So I decided to read it out loud because I think it's easier to listen to it than to actually sit and read it all. So that's what this episode is. This is just me reading this essay. I am struggling with the family proclamation. As many of you know, I got my degree at Brigham Young University in Idaho, and I minored in marriage and family relations. In one of my classes, I had to memorize the family proclamation. Until a couple of years ago, the document had been very important to me. Among my struggles now is the origin of the proclamation. The proclamation came about as a legal document so that the church could show that they were a friend to the court in the Hawaii case when same-sex marriage was being discussed in the early 1990s. The proclamation was an amicus brief written by lawyers, including President Oaks. In fact, in one of his talks, President Oaks lays out how the family proclamation came from the bottom up, not from the top down, as in the prophet and mouthpiece for God had little to say in writing the document. Speaking of which, a member of the General Relief Society presidency voiced her gentle yet hurt and heartfelt opinion after it was read in the women's session of General Conference that she wished the women could have had any say in the matter. She said that they could have suggested changes. Women played no part in creating the document, which I find deeply problematic. In reality, the proclamation is a Frankensteinian creation of different legal briefs from the 80s and 90s used to combat same-sex marriage. Although there is much in the document that I find harmful, there is a good deal that I genuinely love. I love the portions in the proclamation that speak of our divine nature and of our Heavenly Parents, which gives a small acknowledgement toward our Heavenly Mother. I have always found comfort in being watched over by beings who love unconditionally and who are watching out for me and my family from moment to moment. I love the idea of our divine godly potential. I had always been taught that I had the potential for godhood. I found this teaching very empowering, and I wish we could know more about Heavenly Mother. I love the concept of the premortal world. I love knowing that we were taught about our parents' plan, in their presence, to return to live with them forever. I am struggling with the eternal nature of gender. Upon further research, it was said by a few BYU scholars and other general authorities that gender is not eternal. In the 1965 General Conference, William J. Critchlow of the Quorum of the Twelve said that he saw a conscious choice to be male or female. In 1967, BYU professor Hiram Andrus stated, Nowhere in scripture or in any authoritative source is the central primal life of man said to be an intelligence that existed as a living entity in the form and stature of man. Meaning, nowhere does it say that intelligence has had gender. In 1972, BYU professor Rodney Turner stated, The principles of agency must have played a part in anything God did. The arbitrary assignment of sex would have rendered him particularly vulnerable to criticism. In 1983, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, I know of no doctrine which states that we made a choice when we came to earth as to whether we wished to be male or female. That choice was made by our Father in heaven, in his infinite wisdom. So if gender was a choice of the individual, or even of God, is it still essential and eternal? Additionally, Joseph Fielding Smith taught that gender in the lower kingdoms would end. I take it, he said, that men and women will in these lower kingdoms be just what the so-called Christian world expects us to be, neither man nor woman, merely immortal beings having received the resurrection. Joseph Fielding Smith also taught, Is not the sectarian world justified in their doctrine generally proclaimed, that after the resurrection there will be neither male nor female sex? It is a logical conclusion for them, and is apparently in full harmony with what the Lord has revealed regarding the kingdoms, into which, evidently, the vast majority of mankind is likely to go. Joseph Fielding Smith's teachings imply that there would be three sexes, man, woman, and a mortal being. How can gender be eternal if it ends past the resurrection for the vast majority of mankind? In addition to the eternal nature of gender, did you know that a large majority of individuals are born with both sexes? This is called intersex. Intersex is the I in LGBTQIA, and this is when an individual is born with sex characteristics including chromosome patterns, gonads, or genitals that do not fit the typical binary pattern for male or female bodies. It was published just last year that 1.7% of the population is intersex. This is about the same number of redheads in the world. I know that looks small, but with a population as large as ours, that is well over 70 million individuals, born neither male nor female, but a combination of both that varies from intersex individual to intersex individual. Is this part of God's plan? Is their gender eternal? Are they not also patterned after the image of God? If a person can be born into a body with the wrong gender, as is implied with intersex individuals, then who is to say that a gendered spirit cannot enter a body that presents the wrong gender? Doesn't it stand to reason that a female spirit can be placed in a male body? 
And what of these individuals? Why are they punished for transitioning to the gender they feel suits them best? Why does the church invalidate them? If the science of intersex exists, which it does, then why can't those who are transgender fall under the same reasoning? The proclamation talks about Adam and Eve and how their first commandment pertained to parenthood. An interesting fact that I learned is that Joseph Smith taught the story of Lilith and that Adam was a polygamist. No real critique there, I just thought it was interesting. Another part of the document that I struggle with is how our salvation is dependent on marriage and childbearing. Last week, I listened to an interview with an individual who identified as asexual. This is the A in LGBTQIA. Asexuality is the lack of sexual attraction to others, or low or absent interest in the desire for sexual activity. The woman in the interview expressed her deep hurt that the church would place her exaltation in the hands of a husband that she might never want. She felt whole without a life partner and had no desire for children. My question is, why is salvation not an individual thing? This is not to say that salvation cannot be worked out with others, including loved ones. But when the moment comes to be judged or graded by our Father in heaven, and to be placed or not placed in the highest of the highest kingdoms, why isn't this a personal matter? If God looketh upon the heart, why is salvation dependent on marriage and childbearing, if one is even able to bear them? Another aspect that I see in the proclamation is that it is anti-evolution. The proclamation takes its foundation from Adam and Eve and God's instructions to them. Nowhere does science reflect such a young earth and that Homo sapiens were the first human species to exist. Additionally, from studying human patterns, scientists have learned that the ancient family dynamic was worlds different than what we have today. A patriarchal system was not the pattern to live by anciently. In the same interview with this woman, she goes by Maven, she pointed out that she was shocked to find that the patriarchal system that the church patterns itself by was indeed very unhealthy. Why would God pattern his church and his families in such an unhealthy system? The proclamation goes on to say that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between a man and a woman, lawfully wedded as husband and wife. To the research of many, this is the first time that this kind of family was ever taught officially by the church. Joseph Smith and on up until the 1920s, well past the first and second manifesto, this was not the righteous standard for marriage. Exaltation was dependent on marriage between multiple spouses that were not legally binding. Of Joseph Smith's 35 wives, only one of them was legal. In fact, Joseph taught that if a marriage was not performed by righteous authority, it was illegal. A year ago, a woman by the name of Natasha Helfer was excommunicated. I followed her story every step of the way, and it really impacted me. Sister Helfer is a sex therapist and an amazing woman. She advocated for same-sex marriage, citing that it was healthy and there was no reason for the church to be against it. She advocated for self-pleasure, citing its many health benefits, including lowering the risk of prostate cancer and much more. She even spoke out against the purity culture that persists in the church that causes so much damage. For me, this woman represented health in the church, and they excommunicated her. Why? Does the church not care about current studies and research? Does it not care about its members who are being hurt by the teachings embedded in the proclamation? The family proclamation lays out very specific roles for husband and wife. One thing that I have learned, and perhaps this is limited only to me, but when roles are given in a marriage or family, roles are sometimes not met. And when they are not met, resentment and anger and even heartache can occur. Dividing the family structure into his roles and her roles is not healthy. However, when the roles are dissolved and you each take what you can carry, true partnership occurs. There is no longer a plethora of unmet expectations. I was a nanny for four years. In the family that I nanny for, the mother was a doctor and the father stayed at home. This felt very strange to me at first. Why would this family who are members of the church set up their family against the family proclamation? After a time, I grew to understand that the mother had great skill in being a doctor. She was needed in her field, and the children thrived in this seemingly unique setup, and their father was just as vital to their upbringing. That was the first time I'd seen a family set up differently than the church had prescribed, and had witnessed firsthand how good it could be. Why does the proclamation not allow for this family, or families like them? If gender is eternal, and the gender encompasses the natural roles of masculine and feminine natures, then why does the church behave as though it were fragile, and that if not pressed to stay the same, it would likely dissolve. To me, gender is a social construct. Don't misunderstand me. There are distinct differences in male and female genitalia. I understand that. But as far as gender goes, these norms, stereotypes, and assignments are built by society. The family proclamation basically says that children need to be reared by a male figure, and all that the masculine role implies, as well as a female figure, and all that that feminine role implies. But why? If the disintegration of the traditional nuclear family will bring on the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets, why is it never mentioned in the Book of Mormon? 
And where in the Bible does it say this? Have I missed it in all my years of study? And let's say that such verses do exist in the Bible. Why would someone's same-sex marriage harm individuals, communities, and nations? How could two consenting, loving, committed adults harm these entities? Wouldn't this kind of love simply bring more love? The church and its leaders can exclude same-sex marriage in their theology. That is religious freedom. But for them to remove that seat from the entire nation is cruel, and that is not religious freedom. Countless individuals like Stuart Mattis, who took his life in front of one of our church buildings because of the church's stance against same-sex marriage, find no place for themselves in the church. Why would God's one true church exclude so many of his children? Despite the common misconception that a member of the LGBTQ spectrum can reorient themselves through righteous living, as recently implied by Sister Nelson, our prophet's wife, in a 2016 fireside, such efforts are futile. Just because a gay member of the church studies his scriptures and attends the temple regularly and prays fervently for this kind of attraction to go away, it doesn't. It never has for anyone. Additionally, I have observed that LGBTQ couples often want children just as much as heterosexual couples do. When I first started seeing my trauma therapist to somehow reorient myself to being heterosexual, my therapist told me something that really impacted me. She said, Studies actually show that LGBTQ parents are just as good, if not better, than heterosexual parents. A study published in 2008 by the Center of Surrogate Parenting found that not only are LGBT parents an asset to their school communities, they were also likely to be involved and engaged in their children's day-to-day -day educational life. Another study published in 2012 by the American Psychological Association says that lesbian and gay parents are as likely as heterosexual parents to provide supportive and healthy environments for their children. Another study published in 2012 by Life Science found that gay parents tend to be more motivated, more committed than heterosexual parents on average because they chose to be parents. Gays and lesbians rarely become parents by accident compared with almost 50% of accidental pregnancy rate among heterosexuals. That translates to greater commitment on average and more involvement. In 2014, the Washington Post found that children of same-sex couples fare better when it comes to physical health and social well-being than children in the general population, according to researchers at the University of Melbourne in Australia. In 2020, the American Psychological Review, the study my therapist pointed out to me, stated, the results indicate that children raised by same-sex parents from birth perform better than children raised by different sex parents in both primary and secondary education. Another study published by the Frontiers of Psychology in 2021 said that, contrary to prevailing expectations, early studies with mothers who come out as lesbians show that they are just as likely to have good mental health and positive relationships with their children as were heterosexual mothers, and their children were no more likely to show emotional and behavioral difficulties, poor performance at school, or atypical gender role behavior than were children with heterosexual parents. My question then is, if all good things come of God, and same-gender marriage and parenting is proving to be a good thing, then isn't it of God? The Family Proclamation says a lot about parenthood. There are a great many families that are built on adoption, in vitro fertilization, foster care, and even surrogacy. Are these families, the many of them sealed in the temple of the Lord, less valid? Of course not. Why do we not make those same accommodations for same-gender parents? Something else that I find fascinating is that science has already accomplished in mice the creation of offspring without the use of male sperm. This could have huge implications for future LGBTQ couples. The proclamation boldly asserts that happiness in family life is most likely to be achieved when founded on the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ himself said nothing about being gay or trans. What the church seems to mean here is that happiness in family life is most likely to be achieved when the members obey the leaders. However, in my research, this has not been the case. What seems to be the case is that happiness in family life is most likely to be achieved when there persists in it unconditional love. Happiness comes when we live in a healthy, authentic way. In my reading of LDS LGBTQ books, I found that very often individuals who were gay, lesbian, or trans, and who were active in church, actually felt very depressed and lonely. Jessica Fulmer, who was once featured on the Mormon and Gay website, committed herself to being celibate, and then quickly fell into depression, and even suicidal ideation. It wasn't until she allowed herself to live authentically, which for her meant dating and marrying a woman, that she found greater happiness. Even individuals and authors like Tom Christofferson and Charlie Bird have branched out to reach a greater happiness in dating the same gender. In the largest conducted study of LGBTQ individuals, it was said that nearly every person received their own personal revelation that this is what God wanted for them to live authentically to how they felt in dating the same gender. Have so many mistaken their own voice for the voice of God? 
Or is a loving Father in Heaven actually telling them His will? In one of the books I read, put together by Richard Osler, one of the parents of an LGBTQ child, said that after the church made the November 2015 policy, which stated that children of same-sex parents could not be baptized, this father prayed and said that he felt God's words come to him saying that this policy was not of God and that he should be patient. A short time later, the new prophet, President Nelson, reversed the policy. This story stuck with me because this parent received, what, better revelation than the prophet himself? What does it mean when our personal revelation concerning the LGBTQ issues does not align with what the church teaches? And this is another struggle that I have, is that personal revelation in the church does not exist. In an interview with Elder Holland and President Eyring, they said that personal revelation will always confirm what the brethren teach. Does this mean that this father received incorrect revelation that later became correct? If after someone like Jessica Fulmer prays and feels that it is from God that she should marry a woman, is this not personal revelation because it doesn't confirm what the brethren teach? What's the point in seeking God's will in our lives when the prophets have already spoken and are continuing to speak? What other reasons would the church choose to push against same-sex marriage? Is it a matter of the priesthood? Did you know that in the first 50 years or so, the women in the church used the priesthood? Women would give blessings of healing and other blessings. One woman reportedly raised a man from the dead. Another woman promised a man exaltation. Can women not be authorized again to give these priesthood blessings to their children? Wouldn't it be a good thing if even same-gender parents could bless their families with God's power? On the Mormon and Gay website, that no longer exists in the same way, there was once featured 16 stories of individuals who were dealing with same-sex attraction. There are now only two. Asking LGBTQ individuals to live a life of celibacy is not sustainable. Asking them to marry someone they are not attracted to is equally not sustainable. In one version of True to the Faith, it said that homosexual activity is a serious sin, contrary to the purposes of human sexuality. What is the purpose of human sexuality? To create life? Then what of people who marry later in life? Certainly President Oaks married his second wife, who was well past childbearing years, for the sole purpose of having this greater connection with her. How is it any different from same-gender couples? Leaders like Oaks would say that we are asking gay and lesbian members of the church simply to live the law of chastity just like everyone. But in reality, it isn't just like everyone. We are not simply asking them to live the law of chastity. We are asking them not even to hold hands or kiss. We are restricting them far more than any heterosexual dating. We are not simply asking them to live the law of chastity. We are asking them to live without hope every single day. It isn't the same at all. We ought to stop pretending that it is. President Packer, in a general conference address, once stated, Some suppose that they were preset and cannot overcome what they feel are inborn tendencies toward the impure and unnatural. Not so. And then he asked this remarkable question. Why would our Heavenly Father do that to anyone? Remember, He is our Father. Although many church leaders have called homosexuality unnatural, homosexuality has been documented in over 1,500 species of animals. Active member of the church and scientist Gregory Prince gave a recent speech in which he said that homosexuals are indeed born that way. He went on to explain that in the womb, a combination of genetics and epigenetics cause a fetus to become gay. And when I read Tom Christofferson's book, he said that he knew at the age of five that he was gay. So yes, President Packer, why would God do that to anyone? Same-sex attraction is natural. This means that a loving Father in Heaven made millions of His children gay on purpose. Heavenly Father made millions of his children a combination of both genders on purpose. Why does the church push so hard against same-sex marriage when its own personal rights as religion are not and have never been threatened? Nowhere in the history of the church has any leader been forced to perform a same-sex marriage, and they never will be. Why is the church seeking to make this kind of union illegal for the entire nation, when all it really needs to do is teach correct principles to its members and they will govern themselves? Has the church sought to make other things that are against its teachings illegal? Has it sought to make coffee illegal or face cards? To me, this kind of behavior of church leaders is similar to someone saying, you can't eat that donut because I am on a diet. Joseph Smith himself, when he wrote the Articles of Faith, stated that we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. Why has the church been pushing against this? Why is the church seeking to do away with LGBTQ rights at all? So many individuals believe in a God that loves unconditionally and is pleased with his gay, lesbian, and transgender children and every other child under that umbrella. Why does the church not allow them to worship this kind of God? The final line of the proclamation is, 
We call upon responsible citizens and officers of government everywhere to promote those measures designed to maintain and strengthen the family as the fundamental unit of society. This, along with many of the lines in the document, are strictly for legal purposes. They are the glue for this amicus brief. After the court hearing in Hawaii in the 1990s, Hawaii deemed that marriage was indeed only between a man and a woman, and for many years the family proclamation, this amicus brief, held out successfully. However, in 2015, another amicus brief was issued to the case of legalizing same-sex marriage. This brief is what pushed it over the edge and what finally made same-sex marriage legal in the entire country. This amicus brief was written by the children of same-gender parents. They wanted validation in their families. They sought to be recognized. They advocated that these kinds of families were just as healthy as the traditional family. I have heard dozens of stories of children of same-sex parents who are healthy, functioning, outstanding human beings. To believe that the church cannot redefine the family is to believe that revelation cannot come to the prophet and apostles. So many things in the past that were deemed doctrine essential for salvation have been changed and adjusted to accommodate our changing understanding of how the world works. Why not this as well? Okay, well, that's the essay, and I hope you gleaned something from that, and I hope that you will join me again next time. Thanks, guys.